next to the speakers, we'll have uh, Andreas Mellon joining us from uh, IKEA. The kind of the theme that uh, that we had uh, during this presentation is we, what are the benefits for a cross-border merchant to work with a single acquirer, maybe a single cross-border acquirer in multiple markets in Europe. So. What are actually the challenges for, for such a prop proposition? If you really want to have consistent, cost-efficient solution across Europe, what's kind of the vision that you want to realize and what are some of the challenges that are uh, associated with that? And maybe the best person to start with then, Andreas, to say, okay, Andreas, maybe in a couple of minutes, what is your vision in terms of an acquiring solution in Europe and what are the challenges you're facing in practice to realize that? Well, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, the vision is relatively clear. Uh, we would like to cover Europe with uh, two, maximum three acquirers, cover all the payment means, point of sale as well as uh, online. Um, matter of fact is we've done an acquiring tender, a pan European one in the uh, second half of 2017. Um, background is that we have more acquirers than countries for some good reasons um, and some less good reasons. And uh, this acquiring consolidation is also to be seen uh, in combination with uh, our attempt to get one payment service provider for the point of sale, which still represents 96-97% of our revenues. Of course, decreasing over the time, but uh, still 96% is coming through this, on this channel, this point of sale channel. So we have too many decentralized solutions. Now we made a tender for PSP and then we thought it's a good idea to take the opportunity when we roll out a new payment service provider also to streamline a little bit our scattered uh, acquiring landscape. Um, the outcome is that we now have three main acquirers for about 12 to 14 countries. Why it's 12 to 14? Because we still are in negotiations with uh, two more countries. Why it's not covering all of Europe? Well, as you most probably know, we have uh, things like local debit, like Germany, country we are in here, uh, representing more than 10% of our entire revenue. So this is um, something we have to consider. Then you have uh, local debit in Denmark, which for legal reasons you cannot bypass. Norway, Switzerland, Belgium, Portugal, Italy, which you can find a, a workaround. And then you have countries like the Netherlands where you have bilateral agreements which are actually protecting the acquiring market. So it's impossible for a cross-border acquirer to give you a sus financial sustainable offer for uh, uh, debit acquiring in the Netherlands. So all this leads to a quite uh, scattered landscape. Nevertheless, we managed to get uh, a few countries under one umbrella. Um, Interchange Plus Plus, um, we were always lobbying for it for the last uh, nine years, at least me in person, and before that some uh, of my colleagues. Gives us now a little bit more insight about uh, the pricing and, and where the money gets, because we are a true paying member of the payment industry with uh, more than 180 million euros in fees that we pay on a yearly basis. And um, we s see fees like, and uh, we heard it already today, like market development fees for markets that are, I would say, pretty developed. When you think about innovation fee for NFC, and we have 95% of all transactions coming from NFC, then I'm just wondering what the heck uh, are we then developing and financing. Um, and I'm also in uh, constant discussions with the, with the schemes, because during this tender, what we realized, it is very, very tough for, for cross-border acquirers to actually compete with uh, local acquirers in quite some countries. And I think it's pretty unfair because they do a lot, lot of investment and then the local acquirers are actually, to some extent, even bypassing the schemes, which I don't understand the business case for the schemes here because what is the interest of the scheme? It's getting actually the information. It's not so much the payment stream. This is done by the acquirer, by the issuer. It's not the financial term, it's the information. And the very moment you're bypassed, you don't get any kind of information. So if there is anyone from the schemes, I'm uh, lobbying for this uh, since many years. Uh, I still don't get it why it's not possible for those to do true cross-border acquiring that we have one fee, at least on a European level. Under the precondition of direct connect, 
I'm, uh, I'm fine with that, so that you make sure you get 100% of the information and we get 100% of the service. Otherwise, we will still face this uh, scattered landscape, I would say, for the coming years. Because some acquirers, some countries are simply pricing out the competitors. And it's, uh, it's very non-competitive, I would say. So you see this in, in, in Southern Europe. And the last remark I would say before, before uh, I sound here like the lawyer of the acquirers, <laughs> um, during this uh, tender it was also quite stunning to see how few acquirers you can find on the market that are capable to do interchange plus plus. And I'm not meaning the ones that they're uh, doing you playing around with really true interchange plus plus, because we had now the opportunity to compare the offers. And um, I would say it's a, it's a number that you can count on one hand at the moment. So there is a lot to be done from an industry perspective as well. Thank you, Andreas. It would be great to have the other panelists from their perspectives maybe comment on this. So, Roger, maybe start with you. So you, you run into these kind of issues as well in offering from the other side from a provider perspective. So what's your response to Andreas? Observations. Choose what you change as you require. That's the idea behind. No, to be honest, I, I see your points, and and, and, it's, and it's it's really hard to fight against uh, or being in a in a choir in some countries. That you have uh, speaking about uh, Netherlands, for example, France as well. There are also some uh, how can I say it? Some uh, burden to go in in, some, in such markets as a cross border choir. It's very hard to do it. And uh, if you remember the presentation, I made before and uh, we tried a lot to do in, in, in to be an acquire in all these countries and we were very successful but to be very honest not in every country because often when issuers are also acquirers then we lose every time because of pricing issues because you have another dynamic in the market if an issuer is also an acquirer for especially in the CE markets uh, it's often the case and uh, for me as a Swiss as a Swiss guy, uh, often looking to the EU, I dream that really the EU is willing to go forward with, with the term harmonization. Because when I compare Germany with France, for example, it's, it's a total different story. And for us in the cross-border acquiring business, it would be very helpful that we have at the end really standards, standardized um, infrastructure, for example, in Europe. Can you also comment on this and, and maybe from your perspective, if you were to be in charge of European payments, what would you actually change? That's a good question. Um, look, I, I would probably first of all confirm what the other two speakers have just, just mentioned, which is probably not good for a debate because it seems we're pretty much on, on the same position here. Um, so to come back, what I think uh, would indeed be uh, a huge improvement if uh, if we could see from the card schemes, just to go back again to card scheme uh, fees, because we're talking here about acquiring cards, right? Visa, MasterCard cards. So, so the rules they set, they're really fundamental to how this business is functioning and, and whether this is solid and sound or not. And I think it's their responsibility to create what I would call a level playing field. And uh, we are pretty far away from that in, in a number of markets, certainly in our region and, and what I'm hearing also from, from other Western European markets. But it, it, it's really, I think, unhealthy. It's not good for anybody, also not for the schemes. I think uh, Andreas Mellon just made a good point. Um, it would also be good for the card schemes to get full visibility and process all these transactions. And the other thing which maybe I would like to add here is that um, it's not just a distortion of local acquiring versus cross-border acquiring. I mean, if you're a local acquirer and you happen not to be the biggest issuer in the market, you also have a problem, right? So I'm also sitting here re representing a local acquiring business for, for RBI Group. We, we, we also have issues on a local level. So I think it would be very healthy for um, the local and the cross-border uh, acquiring uh, businesses to have uh, card schemes take the responsibility and create with their rules, with their fee structures, a, a level playing field, um, which helps the industry to, to kind of move on. Yeah, then we can compete on, on, on things that matter and bring real value to, to, to merchants, uh, rather than trying to see who, who can cut short the rules on a local level or not. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, maybe Sebastian, from the uh, technology perspective, you know. The payment space is getting so increasingly complex, so it's card payments, there's a number of new payment methods coming to the market as well. We've got P2P payments, of course we have got PC2 coming up, if all the local payment schemes, so how do you manage that? How, how do you help 
uh, acquires to, to work really cross-border. So on our side, we work on both sides, on the acquiring side and uh, on the acquirer side and on the, on the retailer side. Um, and everything that we said today about the uh, language, about the interchange plus, about the complexity of different protocols, then this is what we need to bring on our platform. We need to bring the, comp the agility and the convenience for our customers to be able to handle different cases. And when we see a group like IKEA, uh, that is, I think, uh, one of the largest retailers in Europe that is still having at least from what I to three acquirers and maybe up to five acquirers. We see that having a one global acquirer for Europe will not happen tomorrow for, uh, I would say, most of the retailers on the market. So they will we'll see a, a huge need for uh, retailers to be able to connect to multiple uh, acquirers on different markets. And this is where I believe standardization can bring, uh, let's say, a solution to that, and that's why as HPS we decided to go for Nexo, because we believe that could be one way. This being said, uh, today we are still facing this ISO 8583 common, standard, customized everywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. And today we have no guarantee that the same will not apply with uh, ISO 2022. And, and that's clearly a risk that we have in front of us. And we were discussing recent, so we see from the retail perspective that the retailers are pushing for this, at least, Nexo protocol, because there is a clear interest for them to have, let's say, one protocol to address multiple acquirers. But we were discussing recently with one of our customers uh, on the acquiring side, and uh, they are not ready, I mean, to be Nexo, to move to Nexo. They were basically asking us kind of question about why did we move to Nexo? What is our vision for Nexo? And basically, what is the value prop? So I think there is a push on one end for standardizations for the retail side. But I, I'm not sure this is uh, the same case on the other side on the acquiring business, because they maybe need more to deal with their local uh, constraint. But they don't, I don't know, that's not, at least from our perspective, we didn't see the, the same match on the other side. Maybe also from the FIS perspective, uh, yeah. could you comment on this? Yeah, yeah sure. I think um, what he says, I, I truly agree with that, but uh, looking at um, all the certification costs that the brands impose on the different combinations you have to certify from an acquiring point of view with all the, the terminals you, you support, for every brand, for every combination, you have to do the brand services or the terminal type approval. Um, going back to your point on the schemes, if they want to earn money on that, I think by consolidating that and by making sure that we can convince the brands that one certification with one acquirer can do for all the countries may remove a lot of cost on that level because right now if you want to support with a terminal a certain credit card in country X probably you have to do a certification because the protocol is different um, giving pushback to the schemes and I don't want to step on the toes of the schemes here but uh, that's definitely where acquirers can see a benefit because it will remove a lot of the certification costs they have to do there yeah so if that can be a means to convince them why I choose next so that's definitely one item to, to think about Thank you. By the way, any audience, please use your app or just grab the uh, good old microphone to, to ask the questions to the panel if you, if you want. Maybe from a standards perspective, Norma, um, how would standards help here? Um, or are we going to end up with ISO 20 or 22 flavors like we have with A583? How would you prevent? Can standards really help us here? It's, it's a Sebastian point, I think uh, Nexo is the, as I said, is a collaborative um, initiative. And the only way that we could prevent that is that as we could have as many as possible of each of the categories that will be involved in making sure that uh, we stick to those ISO protocols and we don't deviate and, and do stuff. Uh, and that's the only way. Um, because otherwise, we, we are not mandating anything. Uh, we are there to build those protocols and making sure that the to address the market needs. And, and by hearing IKEA and, and having retailers like IKEA being part of it will be a plus for us, for sure. Because uh, um, they have needs and, and maybe the, the incorporating those needs into um, evolution of those protocols will then make sure that 
uh, we will prevent uh, potentially those uh, developing uh, customizing uh, those those standards. But um, there is not honestly there is nothing that we can prevent uh, as a specification provider. We're trying to make sure that we have as many uh, of the ecosystem players that are co collaborating with us. Uh, but I could understand on the other end, because um, we had, from, from a digital game point of view, we had the same question. Why should I develop something that is fully standards that uh, anyone could plug and play? What is my business model going to be? Uh, anyone will be able to answer the merchant needs. And, and that's what we decide. Yes, that's why we should be building this as an acquirer. This is what we should be doing as, as a PSP. I, I should please my customer needs and making sure that he will be free to use anyone that is bringing values that he's looking for. And I think that's what the standards and having the uh, ecosystem working on them is kind of bringing to the market as of today. Excellent. Questions from the audience? Over there. The Nexo, Nexo specifications you mentioned, are they only in XML? Uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> basically, most of them are XML based, but we are uh, having, um, looking at JSON as another way of uh, using them. And, and also, becoming more involved with W3C and other initiatives uh, around standardization in, the, in that area as well. Thank you. I have one more question, if that's... Oh. Sorry, just for the acquiring, cross-border acquiring. For, to clarify, you're saying that although it's possible, it's still not quite as smooth as you'd like it. Is that the end message here? Or have we... Have you achieved or are we near achieving the cross-border acquiring? Ask me. Yes, we'll take that. Um, anyone? Anyone who can. Anyone? <laughs> we are Andreas and then uh, Gijsbrecht. Well, we achieved it for uh, 12 to 14 countries in Europe. So, and I know some of our members are, 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 sorry. If, if I may add to it, I think that, that kind of like answers it. But so the point is, I think technically you can provide cross-border acquiring and probably almost across all countries in Europe. But at some point, the economic value is not there because you are providing a solution which either doesn't cover the uh, relevant payment methods to the extent it hurts the retailer, or you are confronted with those scheme fees we were talking about that are of such a level that it's just not economically feasible, or the retailer would rather stick with the local solution um, than, than, than move to a centralized solution. So it's not outweighing the, the benefit of simplifying and then centralizing the model. Um, so I hope that, that answers the question. No. Question down at the back. Hi. Yep. Hi. Um, question about uh, standard uh, making or handling uh, being in charge of some standards uh, domestically myself, uh, I find myself uh, battling with um, some disruptive forces, you might call them, uh, as they usually prefer to bypass the standard or, and the, or even the card schemes altogether or the local acquirers altogether instead of uh, joining forces and working together. This is simply because Sometimes it's, from their perspective, it's, mu it's much simpler. It's a simpler project with less partners and, and they want to have uh, time to market, which is very, very stiff. And, and so we sometimes find ourselves chasing them in order to uh, get the, the corporation, which is very hard. I wanted to hear your take on this. Uh, and maybe to spice things up a bit, I wanted to know how usually you handle the fact that uh, some of the partners of those uh, disruptors are uh, actually your members uh, and they're trying to compete each other to compete with each other uh, based on these uh, based on these uh, new and uh, innovative things as I said earlier um, I think you need to look at it from a co cooperative point of view or competition point of view um, for sure, some, some are 
keeping that as an asset to defend from others, um, applying a standards may sometimes be viewed as, okay, um, will uh, people still be using our networks to do stuff? Um, what sometimes they, they tend to forget is that, let's say if you're, if you're uh, um, on the issuing side, there's thousands or millions of people that carry your brand that travel internationally. And when they do, they need to go to the other brand uh, to have their, their card accept. So somehow you're kind of losing money on that side. So, but is that easy? No. Um, as I said, is a, is a collaborative approach and one need to understand the strategic point of view or the business point of view. If you look, just looking at it from an IT point of view, that maybe make no sense. If you're looking at it more from a, a business or a strategic point of view, you could then provide other services that you never thought you were able to do and expand. Thanks. Any more questions? I thought about the question in the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question related to the next. So, um, um, protocols and standards. Uh, the first question how will the uh, the um, how will the um, the uh, um, uh, how will everyone stick to the same format? As I understood, this is the certification centers will uh, will guarantee that everyone will be using the same format. On on the contrary, let's say to ISO eighty five eighty three, and we were, we are talking about the same. Uh, specification which will not change with every every system of uh, every pro provider. This is one question, and the second question. Next, as I understood, a non non a non uh, non for profit organization. And uh, protocol. This is something that has to develop. You cannot stop it at some point and tell we are ready, done. It has to to continue. And how how this. Um, how can you guarantee that uh, the, the, this non-for-profit organization will live in, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? Maria, I'll, I'll let you answer the first part. And yes, I'll take you can take the second one, yeah. So yeah. On, the f on the first one, um, how do you guarantee that everybody is conform and that, uh, that this is it? Um, different to the ISO 8583 and also the reason why APAS had to reinvent itself and becoming Nexo at a certain point in time is because APAS was already ISO 20022 and they were very standard on message formats but what we were missing was kind of an application definition and that was where the Merck or the message user guides came in where there was a real explanation like you would take in any country, an ISO 8583, but really go to the detail on how each field value would be used. Nexo goes to that level, so it's kind of an elaborated ISO 8583, but in a generic way. The reason why it works for many of the, of the members which are in there is because everybody has a word to say in there. So there's 40 plus members in Europe, and also me speaking for FIS, which is a global company, and not only looking at Europe, um, where it works, yeah, and it has been looked at. It's not just something we invented a few years ago, but it goes back from more than 10 years now, I think, where everybody has words to say on this is what this field value should look like, these are the value sets we need, so it's an elaborated standard. And yes, there will be flavors to it, but the test specifications or the test cases have a value, so there's test scenarios who do cover for the business scenarios where um, people see need and fit for, for real in-the-field scenarios. So the test cases are not just a technology uh, invention, but it's real business value-based scenarios. So it should be useful as it is right now. Yeah. And obviously, looking at the collaborative aspect to it, if there's pieces missing, we'll try to guarantee the backwards compatibility in that. And, and how could we guarantee that uh, Nexo will still be there in 10 years? The only way we could do that is by having our existing members, but also new members, uh, getting involved. So if you feel that um, the, um, the mission that we're on serves your purpose, please join Nexo. It's really cheap to be a member, but also uh, you have, the, as Marie just said, you have the ability of kind of building the future, but making sure that we are answering 
our needs because as members we express ourselves and we see what we're looking and what we need to do um, and, and that's the only way people need to be involved and people need to make sure that we are doing the better goods and, and building that road to the uh, to payment acceptance and even more using a standardized way of, of using. So as always there for many years and, and we're building on that methodology, the system, the, the way, and as Marie said, we, we are making sure that um, we're providing guidance as much as possible so that, because um, we had that burden of, of uh, using that standard modified 8583 protocols. So we want to make sure that we're not replicating hopefully the same mistake. Okay, we are at time. Um, I think what we hear here is that cross-border acquiring still has its, its challenges. Um, apparently the, the, the playing field is not completely level, so we all have to play a little bit more creatively to, to provide the service to the market. The standardization is not completely there yet, but uh, work has been done and I think Positive messages. Um, we have a large merchant here at, uh, on the panel, especially realized this in 14 countries, I think you said. Um, two providers uh, in the acquiring space that have a cross-border offering in the market and say, okay, we can do this both in a multi-local and also a cross-country uh, environment. And the technology is getting there too. And I also sense a lot of interest in the, the next standards from the questions that we got from the audience. So. On a positive note, um, it's going in the right direction. I think a lot of work to be done, but um, uh, we're getting there. I'd like to thank uh, the panelists and, of course, the, the audience for, for this interesting session. And uh, see you around. Thank you. Thank you.